to the Guyana Press Association for the invitation to attend. I also acknowledge my colleague from the Transference Institute of Guyana, Troy Thomas. And this is a really provocative theme, keeping power in check. Media justice and the rule of law. It's really thoroughly provocative. It's hard to be calm and keep my voice low. <laughs> So this morning I was on up early and I was reading something from the, um, the Committee to Protect Journalists, this is international body, American base, and the head of it is a, is a, is a man called um, Joel Simon, and Joel Simon has a really lovely essay this morning on my CPJ's website about the importance, the roots of the World Press Freedom Day, and he talks about how it all started in part of the post-war settlement and so on and certain things in the East-West conflict, you know, the communism and all of that stuff. And uh, what it means today, and all those of us should decry it, we should support it and advance it because people lose their lives, some lose their livelihoods and so on, how important it is. And one of the points Mr. Simon made very powerfully, almost emotionally, was about the whole situation with Mr. Trump, President Trump and about how we have a president in the States now who is actively on a mission, it seems, to destroy the media. Therefore, America's role as a, as, a, as a champion of freedom of expression would be correspondingly diminished. And he was, he was looking upon that as a tragedy. I'll be saying more about it. And then, of course, in today's paper, we have a letter to the editor. I think it was the Starbrook News from Mr. Nigel Westmans. And Mr. Westman said a very important piece of work because it's an extensive letter, but Westman went into and he excavated the whole roots of that whole offense of sedition in the colonies, where black and brown people were were colonized by white people. It's not the same thing. It's went into things like the Marcus Garvey movement, UNIA, and the act was brought in to Diana and the colonies, just to suppress that movement. And it's, it's a really important letter, and I completely support his, um, his position there, so I won't repeat it. And then, of course, we have to reach out in that same sentiment that Garvey was echoing, and that so many of us have been echoing, even the colleagues, uh, as Rabbi spoke about the international dimensions of the World Press Freedom Day. We have to reach out south to south and recognize in the global south, people are making an effort to deal with this question and the fight for the truth. And what I will cite, I will cite somebody some of you may not have heard of, but he's a Pakistani scholar, he's a professor of nuclear physics, and he's a fighter for freedom of expression and freedom of the press, and he's a school boy, H W D B H O Y. He's on Twitter as good boy is. And his work is extremely nourishing. Extremely nourishing. Because he's dealing with a situation where they have a republic down there, Pakistan. With all of the instruments, elections, and the president, and court, and appeal court, and all of those instruments that you recognize, former British colony, right? You get it? But, most of the people in the country are not Muslim, Muslim. And the imams have a grip on things. So, Purvis is a professor in university teaching subjects that you might think are objective, subjects like mathematics and physics. I mean, what could be subjective about mathematics or physics? It's a fact, a line is either two feet long or three feet long. You can be two feet and three feet long. But there are people in the faculty who have PhDs and MSCs and teaching the young people. And without getting into the whole of his argument, teaching them stupidness because of the belief system that is in control. So you have formal arrangements that are in control, like the elections and the court and the constitution and all that stuff. And then you have the informal arrangements that can subvert the formal arrangements. And that is the fight that put their school boy is fighting. And it's excellent work. If you want to read the work of somebody like us. From another part of the world, we don't hear about much because most of the news we get comes from the north or other parts of the Caribbean. Check him out. So I, I plug it in. Okay, we can plug each other, south and south. 
And then, of course, there's the rule about the state media. Okay. I think you made, you know, you made some points about the state media that were very important. And who knows it, feels it, who feels it, knows it. I was part of the, I was part of the Caribbean New Media, new media Group, the Trinidad and Tobago, which is a state-owned media house, a TV station and several radio stations. It's right my own show. I used to have a show on Sunday mornings every other week. And I used to have an editor for one hour discussing political issues of the day. And I used to have an editorial every Friday morning with Fazir Mohammed, the one who writes about cricket. Those of you who follow cricket. Me, Fazir, and Jesse made an editorial 15 minutes every Friday morning. And we actually got that, I got in contract with them in about July of 2010. The People's Partnership Government had just taken office. And cutting a long story short, they didn't like how it was going at all. They didn't like it. So what they did is that they forced out three of us. The lady who was running the TV station was a lady called, called Ingrid Isaac. Ingrid was suspended while an, an alleged fraud was being investigated. She's the one who gave me contact. Fazir Mohammed, who's probably the best loved interviewer in Canada today, was an excellent writer about best of these records. Fazir Mohammed, he wasn't fired, he was reassigned. So he came off the morning thing and he gave him a slot at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I, had, they failed to renew my contract. So without ever using the word fire, this is how sinister and cunning these people could be. I'm saying this for the young people in the audience. Without ever using the word fire, the three of us just weren't there anymore. One person was suspended for the investigation. Another person was re reassigned. And this person had his contract, it was renewed. So they never fired anybody. But the three of us weren't there anymore. And that is how these things can go. I mean, we raised a big protest about it, but politics is what it is, and they did not give in. And they kept on going the way they wanted. And that program at that station has actually fallen very far. It was, it was the most popular morning program because of the quality of what was reported, but it fallen very far in the south. And that's how we think it was. I have suffered. It didn't, it didn't affect my livelihood, but it, did, it, it, was, it really bothered me, you know. But the people who fired me, I people like no person. So that's more like that, and we all know each other. And there's no need for that kind of thing. Now let's go to the theme. I kind of warmed up now. Let's go to the theme properly. We really have information age. Yeah? So we talk about where we are. We are in information age. And we were right there decisively because everybody has one of these things. Everybody has one of these things. And for the first time in the history of our civilization as human beings, anybody, anywhere, was a connection. Can tap in a question and get an answer. That never happened before in the history of humanity. What with Google and the people like the web, so that never happened before. So we have literally the phrase they use is torrent, and it's a, it's a potent phrase. We literally have a torrent of information coming at us. Everybody can get that information. In fact, I read a calculation back in about May or June last year, in The Economist magazine, where they were speaking about the fact that for the first time, a calculation had been done of the value of the assets in the world. And that, now those calculations are done periodically, but for the first time in all the years of doing those calculations, for the very first time, oil and gas, was no longer the most valuable asset on the planet. Like I was just about to come here to address an oil and gas conference in which I did last year in July. Oil and gas is no longer the most valuable asset on the planet. The most valuable asset on the planet is data. That is the most valuable asset on the planet. That is where the fortunes are being made. That is where the understanding is being shaped. That is where the conversation is about the conversation. And that is what this conversation is about. So you can understand that coming from. The most valuable answer. So for example, and I'm coming back to all these things and I'm going to come back, just touching on some of them now, I'm going to come back and go deep. So for example, I was talking to a partner last week who's an IT maven. And he was describing to me these companies that run 
the whole IT universe. You know, like Facebook and Netflix, yes, and Google. Amazon is the other one. The way they use it, the better is fine. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google. For those of you who want a cute phrase, fine. That's the phrase they use it for that. Those names are talking about that. So you said, then how the fang is working? Because the fang is working. The fang has a plan, the fang has a mind. How the fang is working? As we say to that other video, you want to tell yourself that you get getting this thing for free. And recently we have had revelations to do with Cambridge Analytica and elections and Donald Trump and Brexit and all that of stuff, okay? And you want to tell yourself, in some kind of way, you may be doing these moral recalculations. We call it rationalization. You want to tell yourself, well, you know, you know, yeah, okay, they were getting something from me. But I was getting something free from them. Because I get to talk to my cousin in New Zealand and my schoolmate from 20 years ago who lived in Canada. We could remain in touch and see each other's children. So it wasn't like I was getting nothing. So you can kind of recalculate it and, and rationalize it in your mind and say, well, they weren't taking advantage of me. Maybe somebody else was being advantage of not me. Because I'm getting something out of this. So you, you, you rationalize. One of the most difficult things for intelligent people to do is to stop fooling yourself. Trust me. That's, for some of us, it's impossible. So I'm coming down to the meaning of fun. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google, fun. Okay. I come down to the meaning of fun. The meaning of fun is this, according to my partner. He said, well, after us, when they make a joke, when they don't understand what this is about, so it's like a book where we put the Congress and he talk and couldn't answer some questions, and he looked kind of sorry. And then a man from WhatsApp resigned from Facebook two days ago, you know? The good things happen in the internet He said, all well, that is a waste of time. He said, the fact is, what these people have put in the IT of the Navy, so they made a mistake. What these people have cooked is a broom that is so intoxicating that probably three quarters of the people who use it on Facebook cannot stop. That's the meaning of it. They cannot stop. Which means, at the moment, it's free. What's to stop them making an announcement that from the 1st of June, if you want to use all the features of Facebook, you have to pay $1 US a week. That is four dollars US a month. That is forty-eight dollars US a year. By how many users? You understand it now? So we are thinking to ourselves that we understand where we are. And I'm trying to be I'm being deliberately challenging in this encounter with you. And intentionally being on that uninterrupted part of the press. I will go to 18, section 18, and I'll talk about that. I've avoided in a different place. So you want to tell yourself that this device is yours and you bought it and you control it. And it's like a top level sci-fi thing like Black Mirror or one of these things. The device is controlling you. The information age is here. It's not coming, it's now. And the maven's control fan are people that we have to understand. We have to understand what the moment means. This conversation is not all about fan. We have to drill down and locate and guy and find that thing. And then, of course, there's a role of citizens. We are all citizens, and we are citizens of a republic. In the case of myself, a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. In the case of yourself, citizens of the Republic of Ghana. Okay. And a citizen only has responsibilities. It doesn't only have rights. You have rights to privacy. You have rights to freedom of expression. We touched on that earlier on with Section 18 and so on. Okay, sedition, also kinds of sedition and so on. We have responsibilities too. I am making the case that citizens in a modern republic, particularly educated citizens, have a special set of responsibilities. And I'm making the case to those of us in this room who are all media voters at one level or the other, or interested parties, particularly the other people in the audience. And I'm making the point that we have a responsibility not just to discuss the thing but the meaning of the thing, which is how I like to say it. Anybody could discuss a thing. So yes, they had a meeting in my morning house and 42 people came. What was the meaning of it? We are here to discuss the meaning of it. I am here to discuss the meaning of it.
And then, of course, coming to the role of the Diana Press Association, we have to treat with the role of the media. The media is, in fact, the interface to use a geeky language. The media is the interface between the citizens and the and the state and the officials of what they're planning to do and what they're actually doing and they didn't do their sense of the media is the interface. And your job, our job, because I consider myself part of the media, our job is to excavate what they're really doing. Compare that to what they said they would do. Prepare some estimates about what is the impact of what they're actually doing. Is there a gap? It is a gap in which direction is the gap, and the gap can exist in surprising directions. Don't assume you know what the gap is. Every time I assume that I know what something is when, I, when, I'm, when I'm going to go and research a particular matter, like eight or nine out of ten times I assume that I know the pattern is going to be so. It is so. When you have to look at the hard primary data, very often, even those of us who consider ourselves experts, we are wrong, wrong, wrong. So the role of the citizen is very important. And we have to balance the scale, because we're discussing an exercise of balancing the scale. We have to balance the scale in between two opposing forces. On the one hand, we discuss the information age that we all exist in. We discuss FAN. We discuss the impact of FAN. We discussed the possibility that three quarters of us are irreparably addicted. And we discussed the amount of information there on us. And what we have to contemplate, if we have a sober contemplation of that, is that what we have created or given birth to at this time in 2018 is what I have termed an information monarchy. We have six, seven, ten people who know a whole lot of things about people that trust me, long time ahead of the CIA, they know that much about people. It has been a totally unprecedented situation. And the, and the real question before us is, when you give someone that amount of power, when you give someone that amount of influence, when there's a lack of proper insight, sorry, I'm sorry, the lack of proper oversight, because there definitely is proper insight. <laughs> When there's a lack of proper oversight, what can we expect? Can we expect charitable conduct? Can we expect Boy Scouts, Code of Ethics? What can we expect to happen to us next? Down here, people looking at us, people who have exposed ourselves in this way. And on the other hand, so over here we have the information monarchy, and on the other hand, we have the citizens of republics. And the meaning of a republic is that all of us are supposed to be equal. We have equal rights, we have equal, equal responsibilities. They're not supposed to be anymore any king this or queen that or emperor or any earl or any baron or any of those things. Those are old fashioned things in the history book. It's a republic. Anybody can become president, right? Any the answer? So, how does one reconcile the reality? that we are in a situation of information monarchy. With the reality that we exist in republics, we are citizens of republics, and those republican impulses have been ignited in us, and they're not going to go up, we're not going to pack them away. We're not going to say, oh, well, that's something we should do last year, we're not going to do this year, which is what is behind the progress of AT. Because people are not accepting that kind of thing. That they might have accepted 50 or 60 years ago. They're not accepting that anymore. Okay? So, section 18 of the, of the proposed um, cytokine bill, I didn't look at it. And section 18 is pretty clear to me attempts to traverse and restrict the right of um, freedom of expression and freedom of comment with respect to how people discuss affairs, in particular, sexual affairs to be aimed at conduct of the state and, and, the, and the conduct of official affairs, okay? And, and serious criminal offenses are put in. The act itself creates quite a number of criminal offenses. I am not, I'm not in support of that approach. I actually think, apart from it being unsupportable, 
and uh, quite likely in breach of the Constitution and, and, and Guyana's treaty obligations, because Guyana would have signed pre treaty obligations that the other colleagues have referred to this morning. Apart from that, there's also the question of enforceability and bringing the system into ridicule. Let's talk about that for 30 seconds. So, you as a government are serious about, about an issue. If you bring a law and you propose a law, you draft it, and you put it in place, and perhaps just this once, the opposition and yourself, who could never agree on anything, you agree on this one thing. But you say Trinidad and Tobago for whatever reason. So you agree on this one thing. And you vote and you get the law with all of the, uh, what you call it, special majority to suspend the rights in the Constitution. And all these sorts of, all these sorts of aspects of the law are satisfied. For anybody here was a legal minor, so you're at least one of them. Okay, all of those aspects are satisfied. It's a satisfactory piece of law in that respect. It could withstand the test in the court. But what is all that about really? If government decided to do a program concerning X, whichever government, because we all voted them for it right So if X is something that they're doing, and people are objecting to X because they don't want it, and they're protesting, and they're making memes and cartoons and calypsos, and, and they're making everybody look ridiculous, and jokes, and all kinds of things. The only way you want this now is not a simple thing again. It's, it's 19 different ways you could ridicule somebody. So you're doing it, you're doing it, you're putting things on Facebook, puppets, all kinds of things. You make a false thing with an anonymous, you do all kinds of things. Who are you going to prosecute? Because the way you want this now, all of those things will emanate from outside the government. That's what happened to the world. That's what the U.T. in America is about with Trump and Russia and the U.T. And the people who are tweeting and things. Not only in America. They can't hold anybody. The most you can do is hold somebody who would really tell a man something. But the people who are tweeting and pretending and whatever, they were never in America. They were in some warehouses in Russia or whatever. So that's the world now. So the very sad, the very sad thing that you're trying to fight with is not even in the room. That's the fine. That's the fine of the room. It's not in the room. Okay? Now, the best book I would suggest, is a couple of books I'm going to suggest to you, but I read, in, I read intensely about these questions. And then I'm going to try to suggest an, an agenda for some things that we should be thinking about. The first book I would suggest that gives a proper, compact insight into this question about the information age and the role of FANG and, and the national security aspect of it, which I haven't touched on so far, because the national security agencies have all your information. Eh? This is a joke that I'm... No, sorry. I won't make that joke. So, the fact is that we have a situation where the book I'm recommending is No Place to Hide. Very simple title. By Glenn Greenwald. Glenn Greenwald is an attorney, a constitutional attorney by profession. He's also a writer, he wrote for the Guardian and so on. And he is the one when Edgar Snowden wanted to meet somebody to disclose his papers. Edgar Snowden was trapped in Russia. Edward Snowden was trapped in Russia. When he wanted to meet somebody, he sent for Glenn Greenwald. He said, I want to meet you because of the quality of his work. And they had a whole secret thing about what they actually meet. The first half of the book is really a description that will make your jaw drop. They think you know how much they know about you. Read no place time. It'll be like this. All that stuff on the internet about buying something to a firewall and to buy something to prevent spam, all of those companies have signed up contracts with the Americans and they get everything about everything. All the Apple is saved out of this one, all of that is just we'll talk. Everybody is sharing everything. Fun. Good. And for fun to get to where it was, fun to do a deal. Just because you see certain people within political for a moment survive. It doesn't matter who comes to the government. This one comes to the government, they pay. They lose election, they come to the government, because it's still big. I'm not calling it, you know, I got people so much like that. They pay, they pay, they party in power. And you know why? They had to cut a deal. I don't mind chicken eggs, it's not any prayers or anything, they cut a deal. Something they can't talk about. They went down many nights and they agreed with this. And that is what found it. Understand me? Found that the deal. So that's how all that information is there. No place to hide. The first half of the book describes in tremendous detail. You will never forget it. 
exactly how all of our information is compromised. The second half of the book, I, I am predicting, is just seem to become a classic. Like how we hear about essays by Rousseau, or an essay by C.L.R. James, or an essay George Lanning would have written, or Martin Carter, essay, the essay is 60, 70 years old, people still talking about it. And then you need to understand why I don't report. But I say, you read some of these things, okay, now Paul. Those essays by Glenn Greenwald in the second half of the book, he discusses, as I said at the beginning, not just the thing, but the meaning of the thing. He discusses, Greenwald discusses the meaning of the fact that we no longer have privacy. And not only do we no longer have privacy, we fully well know that we no longer have privacy. Therefore, the fact that we fully well know we no longer have privacy is affecting and has affected our minds and the way we communicate with each other. It's really, it's really provocative. It's affected the way we organize politically. What we say and we don't say to each other. And in a certain dimension, we are extremely, extremely frank. And we have a kind of an exchange, and a kind of lapure, and a kind of whole talk with each other. That we could not 15 years ago in public. So you're going to tell a politician what I find is about, and come out on Facebook. But at another level, we're not really, really having the discussion we need to be having. We're not having a real conversation. I want to go there now. So I'll return to the start of my speech when I started speaking about Joel Simon, who's the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. And Simon had this lovely essay in this morning's web page where he talked about the meaning of the World Press Freedom Day. And he talked about, in particular with a lot of pain, about the, the, the aspect of Mr. Trump, President Trump's behavior, and his sort of decision to attack the press, and how that would undermine the whole cause. And I want to stay, stay here and go into some deeper waters now, I'm warming up so far. I want to stay here and I want to say, so what? So. So what if England voted for Brexit? So what if America voted for President Trump? Why is that bothering us? In fact, I am delighted. I was delighted when Trump was here. I was delighted when England voted for Brexit. I felt I'm sure. I ain't ashamed to tell you. I felt that true. And I'm going to tell you why I felt that true. Because it's coming to the question of the real conversation. You see, what has come out of the, of the pain and anguish that people are feeling now, people like Joel Simon and so on, people who've been writing about these things, is the fact that the large extent the media gave birth to Brexit, and the media gave birth to President Trump. They gave them lots of free publicity from never to pay for the response. It just everybody was writing about it one time. Okay. So there's a responsibility. You see, the, 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 main, the main anchor in the theme is keeping power in check. And I want to bounce with you now and, and, and say to you, it's a little bit more, it has to be more, than merely keeping the power of the state or keeping the power of this political party or that in check. It's also the media to recognize it has a power and it has a responsibility. How do we keep that in check? Because the, the, the obverse of it is, is, is events like Brexit and President Trump. That's what happens. So it was interesting. It might not have been true, but it's interesting to put it on TV. Can you understand it? And then it was funny. Maybe it wasn't true, but it put that on TV too. Are you getting it? And then somebody was saying something that he might be a racist thing in England, but you know what? False equivalence. He has an opinion too, so he put that on TV too. So the responsibility discussion and the, and, and the keeping power in check discussion has to be deep if it is going to be a complete and a meaningful one. It really has to be. Who are the monsters we are growing now? In the dark. Feeding them and minding the plants and getting them and talking to them in the morning. Who are the monsters we are growing now? Who is coming in the next 20 years to do with us? Are we dealing with them nicely now? And it's just a point of view. 
and so on. But that's what happened. And from all the, all the jokes and the laughter, you try to make out that he's a stupid man. He played every single one of them. Going to Columbia and Yale and Harvard. He played all, 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 and he could say all. The default said all. Our real conversation, and the reason I am happy about the Brexit decision and the President Trump's election is this. All the time growing up in the Caribbean, and I spent some years in England, all the years growing up, I have been in thousands of conversations with people, educated people, conscientious people, people who want to be better. And they're discussing this thing or that thing, whether it was the education, or the police, or elections, or the economy, or whatever the major things we were discussing in time, about the years of friends and family. And eventually, the conversation always seemed to come to a particular point. And the point was this. The conversation seemed to come to the point where, in fact, somebody would sigh and they would say, well, you know if this was in Birmingham, that person would have resigned by now. This was in England. I was up there last year with my family. That was in England, that person would have resigned. And then other people say, well, in fact, if that was in Delaware, the police told him right, because they don't make joking those things around the Sam and the That was the sentiment. An underlying sentiment was a belief system that said that these people, the colonials, the white people, these people in the global north, these people have their business organized. These people have a philosophy. These people have a way to put their philosophy in effect. These people are better than us. I never accepted that. I used to argue plaintively for years, years and years. They all had to like that business. And then Brexit happened. And then President Trump was elected. And at last, we have a possibility, because nothing in life is ever more than a possibility. Yet. And you have to recognize the possibility and play for change. For the first time in my life, we have proof positive, unavoidable, that where politics is concerned, England will do stupidness. And where politics is concerned, America will do stupidness. And for all the people who don't read books, and it's not only young people, but I know young people who read books. For all the people who don't read books, and that history book is too much, one of them who always on their phone, or on Facebook or some of those fun things. For those people who are always there, because of what Brexit represents in terms of the collapse of everything England might have been, and it's, if the collapse is still going on, it's going to be epic. Eh? And because of the election of President Trump also represents a similar shift and no collapse, it is being played out in extremely anguished terms right across time. So even those who do not read a book, they will not get the message. So the possibility exists for so the first time as Caribbean people, as people of color, people of African descent, Indian descent, maybe global south, for the first time, we have the possibility that we can recognize our problems, look them in the eye, realize that the other people, those people, they can be stupid this too, on a big scale. OK? So if some feeling bad about yourself, stomach squint, take the monkey off your back, that addiction, and let us start to walk forward and deal with our problems. So I am extremely young that Brexit it up. And then he cried when Trump was elected, just emotion, I was so happy. Every time he does something that's outrageous, yes, do another one down. Give us one like four o'clock. I want people to feel it, I'm not stopping here. The, the man will know better than you here, take another stop. And then you might wake up and understand what is going on. For us in the Caribbean, my own observation, my own belief is that we have become captivated by a set of party political thing, what I call race talk, um, identity politics, a whole identity politics, epidemic to stick over the place. And you can't get a discussion about regionalism. Why can't we get a discussion about regionalism? Why, when last was there a good, hot, solid exchange about regionalism? Is it something we should talk about again? We shouldn't bother. Maybe we should bother. I think if we had proper regionalism, my respectful views, then I would be in a better place to deal with 
for example, the refugee problems you're having with the neighboring countries. I think they need a better place to deal with that in international and regional form. But regionalism is something you almost never get a discussion. Okay. Where are we with respect to the environmental changes that are coming? Those of you would have seen this strange weather and so on is coming. It's here. How is a country like Guyana, with all of its potential and its beauty, how is Guyana going to reckon with that, with sea wall, sea level rise? So what, is, what is the plan? Is there a plan? Is the regionalism have a way out of it? So there are very serious matters where you have a discussion on what is the role of agriculture in transforming the Korean economy? Can we make use of our diaspora to promote agribusiness? That discussion on this race of agriculture and the transformation of the economy, where does marijuana fit into that? I'm completely serious. Where does marijuana fit into that? Does it fit in? Now, I mean, now that the white people have legalized it, we can start to talk about it. But are we going to legalize it? On what terms? On what terms? Are we going to legalize it as an industry? Or are we going to wait and pretend we don't know what's happening and wring our hands and let our leaders up the hook? And when you turn around, you see slice in four or five years and you find out that they are. And this company and that company have a license, and for you to call something that, you have to go to them and not open. So they license only names and everything. We are here for that. We have the opportunity to pass us by again. What is the agenda for us as Caribbean people? An agenda that has 10 years in it, 20 years in it, 30 years in it. How do we use fun to promote our agenda? And that is what colleagues in the media in my respect, what you should be considering. How do we use fun? How do we use Google with YouTube to promote these discussions and these ideas? Yes? How do we use Twitter to promote these discussions and these ideas? How do we escape, as I call it, the shadows of identity politics? So this one over there is a quarter Chinese, and therefore I must recognize this thing at home. And the main thing we are discussing it. Like we can't seem to find the time. We are discussing something more interesting. Um, I also want to close up by saying this point. I want to quote Lloyd Best, my late friend, very young thinker. He lived in Guyana for a number of years. And I want to quote Lloyd when he gave a speech in about 06 or 07 about what had gone wrong in Canada and Tobago. And Lloyd was actively trying to challenge people who said they were working for a change and who said they wanted a different outcome. And according to Lloyd, if you want a change and you want a different outcome, you have to move beyond merely what is true or what is interesting. Because there are plenty of things that are completely true and that are very, very interesting. And you can discuss them, as you know, people say, forevermore, and nothing will change. We have to develop the discipline to focus on what is decisive and make that our own if we want to make a change. So that's what I want to say to colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity and your attention. And thank you very much. Thank you.